my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page physics at the and school of astrophysics and astronomy and youtube channel pritam kumar i'd like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar so good afternoon all to uh, here in bangladesh and uh, a very good evening to all those who are watching this program live from australia so hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic so all we know that we are trying to adjust with this new normal situation as we cannot continue our normal academic program inside the campus so we have to start our online program i think you have already come to know that the department of physics of the university of science and technology has started this online program including international physics webinar and we have successfully completed our 156 international physics webinar and today it's our 157 international physics webinar so today i would like to welcome you all to a joint session between the department of physics of the university of science and technology and the department of physics and astronomy macquarie university sydney australia and we have with us here today dr dev m crane professor uh, department of physics and astronomy macquarie university sydney and she has already connected with us so i'd like to welcome our speaker so madam uh, good afternoon and good evening to your part so thanks for accepting our invitation madam and I would like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology, for accepting our invitation. So, before going to our speaker, I would like to uh, inform those who are new that uh, we have divided our webinar into three parts. First of all, we would like to welcome our speaker, and then our speaker will deliver her speech, and at the end, we have a discussion session in that time anybody can join with us and you can also ask questions by commenting so today is international day of light so happy international day of light to all and our topic is related to that so i think you have already come to know the title of this today's international physics webinar and title is the international day of light 2021 optical surface profiling at micro nanoscopic scale and our speaker is Jeff M. Kane, Professor MQ Photonics Research Center and Department of Physics and Astronomy, Macro University, Sydney, Australia. And uh, we can see her uh, academic and professional career. So Professor Deb Kane holds a personal chair in physics at Macro University, Sydney. She received a bachelor degree in physics from University of Otago, New Zealand, and her PhD degree from the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. Her current research interests include uh, photonics dynamical system, quantifying complexity, the optics and optical properties of certain spider webs and silks, quantitative microscopy and nanoscopy, and laser materials processing. She is a fellow of the Optical Society and the Australian Institute of Physics, AIP. Uh, she was the AIP woman in physics lecture, lecturer and the medalist uh, uh, in 2006. Uh, she chaired the IUPAP Commission on Laser Physics and uh, Photonics 2015-2017. She is a member of the National Committee of Physics and is the chair of the Accreditation Committee of the AIP. We can see her research field, photonics, dynamical system, quantifying experimental time series data, optics and optical materials of spider waves and spider silk and related bio-optics, bio nanometrology, laser material processing, photonics-based conservation science. And this is her Google Scholar ID. Her citation is more than 2000. And this is a recent publication. So thanks. For all of your patience, now it's time to go to our speaker. So, Madam, thank you again. So, it's good your evening. time. Thank you. Can. Yeah. Good evening and good afternoon. Can you? Am I? Yeah. You can see. And. Uh, Oh, you no, can no. see my screen? Oh, no, 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 no. Please uh, click over the PowerPoint. Not here. Not here, madam. Click. Be beg your pardon. Sorry. Please click, yeah, click over the PowerPoint. Yeah, now. now we can see. Okay, so you can see the presentation now? Yeah. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, thank you very much for asking me to do this. It's, I, I always like to celebrate the International Day of Light uh, in special ways, and so this is um, a big part of my celebration of the International Day of Light. Uh, and the talk I'm going to give you will talk a little bit about the International Day of Light, and then I'm going to talk a bit about one of my um, areas of research. And so it's already been introduced, this lovely logo that we have for the International Day of Light. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of about how we came to this. Uh, and the International Day follows the International Year of Light, which was in 2015. Uh, and that was a major effort around the world for um, UNESCO to put the case to the United Nations to actually create 2015 to be the International Year of Light. Uh, and there were very many, th more than 13,000 official International Year of Light events took place in 147 countries and reached hundreds of millions of people. Uh, and the success of that international year, which some people argue was probably the most successful international year of any sort that's occurred, uh, was such that the momentum was there to keep the um, efforts that people were making sustained. And the way that it was decided to sustain this was through um, having an international day of light every year. And UNESCO uh, led and resolved uh, for that to occur. And the first one of these occurred in 2018. And the date was chosen as the 16th of May because the 16th of May 1960 was the date that Ted Maiman demonstrated the world's first laser, which was a ruby laser. So the, if the celebrations don't all have to occur today. Um, any of the events and acknowledgements of light and light-based technologies can occur within really a month either side of this date uh, and we so we in the optics and lasers and light community uh, like to celebrate it multiple times through that period. But just to go back to what the International Year of Light and light-based technologies and the push that was created at that time and a little bit of a personal view on what happened um, here in Australia in that International Year of Light, then all of health, communications, economy, environment and social interactions are all important in terms of what was being promoted. Uh, and the overview of this uh, was such that there really was a build of an enormous amount of um, enthusiasm around the world to celebrate science and technology, culture and art, everything in the light-based space. Uh, and in terms of why light? Well, light-based technology is a major economic driver with potential to revolutionise the 21st century as electronics did the 20th century. So that was the overarching uh, push for the international year. And we celebrated it uh, in Australia many, in many, many ways uh, through the whole of the year. But one of the things that um, I did as part of my activities promoting the International Year of Light was to make contact with the city of Sydney uh, and the group within the city of Sydney that organised the New Year's Eve celebrations uh, that we have every year here in Sydney. Uh, and through that, uh, they agreed to actually have uh, projections about the International Year of Light projected onto the pylons of the Sydney Harbour uh, bridge. And so these are the sort of unusual experiences you can have um, as a physicist, uh, where you end up inter interacting with a group like the City of Sydney to uh, encourage and motivate them to uh, acknowledge the International Year of Light. So the International Year of Light in Sydney began by the celebration through this projection onto the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Uh, and another thing that happened on New Year's Eve was that we went uh, and delivered um, these light-based demonstrations to the children at the Lord Mayor's Picnic, uh, which is an, an annual event that also happens on New Year's Eve, organised by the Lord Mayor of Sydney, uh, in order to have a, a very nice uh, occasion for the families of um, children who are having various challenges in terms of their health and well-being uh, and that was a great pleasure to do that as well. So these were the sorts of things that were happening around the world uh, in the International Year of Light. Uh, I'm not going to read all of this but again during that year people put a great deal of effort uh, into thinking about light 
uh, and this is a very nice article which you can come back and refer to in full. It was published in the International Commission of Optics newsletters, newsletter in January 2015. And just the first sentence there, you can see light is a prerequisite for life as it is the ultimate source of energy in our foods. Uh, light is integral to religion, to creation stories, to poetry, to literature, to language and to art and culture. Light is atmospheric beauty as is in the sunset and the sunrise, the rainbow and the auroras. So I think we all have a good understanding of when we go about our lives, uh, how much beauty uh, light brings into them and also how useful it is in our technologies. Uh, just to, a little bit about how the logo arose. So you've got the sun in the middle as representing the origin of life, sustainability, culture, and if the universality of us all living under the sun. Uh, you've got the flags indicating that all the nations in the world were being involved and the colours being the colour spectrum for science, art, culture and education. And there are some really excellent resources that are still available uh, that you can look at any time uh, that were archived from the International Year of Light. And this is the official Light 2015 uh, web page. And any of these um, pictures here, they all have a title. When you go on the web page, uh, you can take the headings here, what's going to be under them, why light matters, learn about light, hands-on involvement. And you can go in and it's a multi-level uh, website thereafter where you can see um, and learn about any of these elements of light. And I encourage you uh, to actually visit that website uh, and learn about uh, light a bit more from what's available in those resources. In terms of then picking up and developing the International Day of Light, then this is also being done uh, in concert with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So the fact that they changed the logo is reflecting that now we've combined the symbolism from the International Year of Light symbol with the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And they are listed there. Uh, and they are, of course, the sorts of goals that all of us want to see happen in the world. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry, in innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible con consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on the land, peace, justice and strong institutions and partnerships for the goals. So the aims of the International Day of Light are really for those of us who are in the business of light and optics and lasers and their applications and their uptake in all sorts of uh, uses, uh, want to then be making sure that those activities also link uh, with the sustainable development goals. So I'm just going to give a little bit of a um, tutorial back at, a, at quite a simple level, just to remind people about some of the uh, parts of the technology that we're going to be using in our research. So the laser, which this date, it's the 61st an anniversary of the first laser being operated today. And that's an acronym, acronym that stands for light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. Uh, and what we uh, want to understand with lasers is that we need both the wave model and photon models of light to be able to understand lasers. Uh, we need to know how light interacts with matter and we need to understand the nature of matter and atoms and how light is produced by matter. And we need the optics uh, that enables us to put the actual laser systems uh, together. Have, putting the mirrors around the gain medium was one of the, uh, the big uh, advances that needed to happen to be able to get lasers to operate in the first place. These are some of the people who were there at the very beginning. Um, Gordon Gould is actually the first person to actually patent the idea of the laser, though that was not uh, accepted until relatively recently in time. Charles Towns and Arthur Shallow uh, put, had a patent. Theodore Maiman, we've mentioned already, Ted Maiman, who was the person who got the first ruby laser going. Uh, Nikolai Basov and Alexander Prokhorov in Russia, uh, who also worked on the 
uh, laser in the days of you know the Cold War when uh, communications between Russia and the West and the rest of the world was not that uh, good. Uh, just an interesting point, Alexander Prokhorov was actually born in uh, Queensland in Australia uh, to parents who had immigrated to Australia from Russia uh, and he went, she went back to Russia as a four-year-old, uh, which I think is an interesting bit of history. Uh, and this is the team uh, that got the first CW um, helium neon laser in the infrared operating uh, early in 1961. So those are a few of the histories, uh, just those people. These are just from the um, notebooks uh, of Gould and the original Nature paper, this very short paper uh, by Maiman uh, announcing the operation of the first uh, laser. Uh, Maiman didn't get any prizes uh, it, for a very long time for the operation of the uh, Ruby laser. I'm sure he'd be really pleased uh, at the acknowledgement of that contribution to the world uh, that is being made through the date of the International Day of Light. Uh, that's a picture of Maiman with his laser uh, and the uh, group with the helium neon laser there. So clearly uh, Maiman's laser was a pulsed laser uh, and this, I'm not going to talk about the theory of lasers, it's not the topic for today, uh, but there's a, a lot of um, interesting uh, subtleties and the different sorts of lasers that you can achieve in this day and age. The main features of the light that we're going to get from a source such as a laser, we're going to be concerned about its colour, its wavelength, the spectrum of the light, what kind of output power we can get if it's pulse, that will involve the peak power for the pulses and the average power over time, uh, and how that power is delivered as a function of time is also very important to us, and the spatial beam pop properties of the beam will also be important. So there's a lot of features about various lasers we'd want to know about uh, before we were going to determine what was the right laser for the right application. And what will be key to some of the research I'll talk about later is coherence of the light. And so when we think about the difference between a laser beam and a regular light bulb, then we know that the prism will disperse the white light into the full visible spectrum. Uh, we have a laser beam which is going to be collimated and give us this single colour of light is the way we think of it mostly, though now then when we have these uh, very short pulse lasers, then they obviously, through the Fourier transform, have very broad uh, spectra, but, but and that's another one of our features. So we want, if, if for a laser, we're going to have this collimated beam. Most often we want to have it very single frequency so that it will be very co coherent. Regular light will diverge and we'll have to use optics uh, to uh, condition it. Coherence, coherent meaning all atoms are going to be emitting their uh, light with the same phase. So even if we're building up power, we're building up power by all of those photons as waves being emitted with exactly the same phase. If we are having less coherent light, then that will involve multiple frequencies, but also the waves that are emitted having uh, random phases. So there's two elements to that. Okay. So we have these very different light sources, both of which are going to be relevant to the optical surface profiling we're going to be talking about. This incoherent light, many colours mixed together, radiating in all directions, said to be incoherent. Laser light, one colour generally, thin collimated beam, and we are aiming for coherence mostly. And we'll talk. Okay, so just back to Maiman with his particular laser. And that's what we are celebrating through the date today, though clearly we're celebrating much more. And we need, in order to build up that field, the part where we get the amplification, that involves having the mirrors around the gain medium and aligning them so that all of those photons that are passing backwards and forwards in that cavity all line up with each other. So that's a rather simple uh, reminder of the laser. I hope it wasn't too simple, but it's just to get everybody in the room thinking about the International Day of Light and some of the light sources. LEDs are now obviously very important and LEDs are uh, the non-laser version of semiconductor lasers. If we look around the world today and think about what most lasers are, most lasers that are in use uh, in systems are now semiconductor lasers, but we still do have solid state lasers uh, and 
not so many gas lasers, but still gas lasers. So, okay. Some nice pictures. This is a, uh, from a company called Cobalt, uh, and they, when they have their exhibitions, they'll line up lasers of all the colours and the visible that they produce and pass them through uh, these ground uh, glass scatterers, and you can see all the different colours that they can achieve. If, when you work in laser labs with lasers like these sorts of systems, then just the, the look of them is really rather special. The visual aspect of working with visible lasers uh, is a very nice part of it. Okay, uh, and just to come back to uh, Arthur Shallow, who I was lucky enough to uh, meet when I was a, a post doc back in uh, 1985. Uh, I was working on a project uh, at the University of Southampton in England, uh, and I got to go and visit a couple of labs in Stanford to have some discussions. Uh, and one of the people I was lucky enough to visit in their lab was um, Arthur Shallow. Uh, he was a very delightful and humble man and great fun and this is quite a famous picture that he had on the door of his uh, office uh, in the early days of the lasers when people started talking about the uh, death ray laser uh, and he had this for the incredible laser and for credible lasers see inside uh, was what he had on the door of his office okay i'm gonna skip that one so Okay, so that tells us a little bit about the International Day of Light. This is just an overview that's introducing um, the various things that I do work on uh, research-wise as and when I can resource them. So most people would know me best um, for the work that we do in nonlinear laser dynamics, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, we've also, in our laser materials processing, we do some uh, research on trying to come up with uh, things of value for um, conservation of uh, cultural heritage, particularly um, in indigenous bark paintings for Australia has been uh, a key uh, interest of ours. Uh, and, uh, and back in 2007, I started doing some projects based on an observation made out of my office window, which has seen us do quite a lot on looking at the optics of spider silks. And a little bit of that will come into play when I'm talking about optical surface profiling, uh, because this is one of the profiles of a, a, an optical silk. Uh, but we also do nanometrology with that. And more recently, we've been also doing some um, laser processing of muscovite, which I'll say a bit about it from the optical profiling point of view. So coming back to the uh, sort of research side of this talk, which is to talk about optical surface profiling at the micro and nanoscopic scale. And what I like to do in these talks is also thread a, through a bit of the story about how you come to be doing sorts of types of research. And so in the case of this optical surface profiling, oh, first of all, these are the people that I have done the research uh, that I'm going to be um, introducing today. So these are the profilers, as I like to call them at Macquarie, Doug Little, uh, Sir Robert Wasti, uh, Benjamin Snowden, uh, Simon Pleasance, Rajika did a um, summer vacation scholarship with us, uh, Adam uh, worked um, in early days, this is Doug again here, uh, and we collaborate with uh, people in up in Australia around the world. So um, Jadish and Michael Gow and Tim Burgess from the group at ANU, um, Marta and Esther from Madrid and Spain, Alex Furbach and Robert Carmen on staff uh, at Macquarie as well. And Shalom Ramirez is a biologist who works on um, spiders at UNSW. Okay, so what's the motivation to start doing optical surface profiling? I'll tell you about what ours was, I'll tell you how the systems work. And I'm not going to be, these, these are instruments that lots of people buy for doing things like testing the flatness of silicon wafers, uh, all manner of what I might regard as fairly straightforward um, technical applications. I'm not gonna be talking about those sorts of things today. I'm going to be talking about pushing these instruments into doing a few things that they weren't necessarily um, intended for in the first place. This is looking at materials, glasses and optics that we work with, which have low reflectance surfaces. So they're challenging because of that and some things which are challenging because of their size. Okay. Okay, so why did we start doing this? Well, back in the late 90s, we were doing research on using pulsed lasers 
for removing particulates uh, from surfaces. This was a very interesting topic at the time, both from the fundamental science perspective, but also from the applications perspective. At that time in the world, there was a lot of um, in effort to reduce the water that was used in ultra cleaning uh, applications in semiconductor fabrication facilities. And this idea of using pulsed lasers to, uh, if you have a short pulse of light on a surface uh, and you get a very fast differential heating uh, of the material and the particle that might be sitting on it, and that leads to a a momentum transfer that you can actually use to de-adhere the particle from the surface and then you can use some kind of flow of air or gas uh, to actually move the de-adhered particles away. And the actual um, physics of what's going on in that material uh, laser pulse interaction is really interesting. I'm not going to be talking about that today, but we wanted to transfer that idea into optical materials rather than silicon. Silicon is a highly absorbing material. And so when you go into optical materials, then you have to use much shorter wavelengths to get any absorption in the glass material at all. So most of the absorption is occurring in the particle, but also uh, we were wanting to see if we could use this as a way of being able to uh, clean optics uh, in optical industry type applications, but also the fundamental science. So the system we were using for that was a frequency doubled copper vapor laser. And frequency doubling is a technique that takes you from the um, green wavelength here, which is one of the lines emitted by a, a copper vapor laser. And then you use a nonlinear crystal to do second harmonic generation and you get half the wavelength, uh, which we then use uh, for uh, processing and doing our laser uh, cleaning. And this has worked out to be a very nice technique for removing small par particles from glass. Uh, this is showing the removal of three micron alumina particles here, 100 nanometer alumina particles. And when you get the pulse fluence that you use for doing this right, you can, this technique works very well. But when anything like this there's going to be some threshold at which you don't just remove the particles, you actually start damaging the material. And because the material is this clear glass, it's actually really hard to see the damage uh, that you might be doing. And so uh, this is just showing the, the actual quantitative measurements that you can make of how much you can clean the particles. And what we found uh, was when you increase the pulse fluence quite a lot, to much higher values, we actually, with a lot of contrast enhancement and messing about, we could see that we were having a damage site here which was commensurate with the actual beam size. This, so these are on the same scale. And there's a lot of particles in that footprint. And we weren't sure how damaged this was. At first thought, we thought these would be very sort of shallow but they were very, very hard to see. And if you're working with glass materials, you could have damage in this case and not actually be aware of it and acknowledging it. And to actually measure these damage sites at the time, um, I tried to get somebody to let us use the as a physical stylus profiler. And of course, nobody would let you take a sample that had these particulates on it, which might still be there anywhere near a stylus profiler because they were concerned uh, that it was just going to leave stuff on the stylus. I did manage to um, talk in, with collaborator at UNSW and get an AFM uh, scan of one of these. This is inverted, uh, which actually showed these are actually really rather deep. Um, this is you know, almost three microns deep, this damage site on this, this glass material caused by this effect. And this was a really hard result to get. We spent a, a couple of days and many, many hours uh, getting this result by AFM. And so when we were continuing this line of research at the time, then we really needed a better way to be able to characterize these damage sites. And that was when I started looking at establishing an optical surface profiler to, to, for this particular application. 
So we'll do a little bit of a refresher now on interference because an optical surface profiler is a form of an interference microscope. So we remind ourselves of our um, high school and early uh, interference ideas. So for our Young's double slit experiment, we take the light through the two slits and by virtue of the optical path differences of light from one slit compared to the other on the screen where we're observing the interference pattern, we will get bright fringes when the optical path differences are zero or some integer multiple of a wavelength and we will get destructive interference when we have a half wavelength uh, path di length difference between them. Okay. And if we do that experiment with a single frequency laser, this one, standard one you've probably seen before with a helium neon laser beam, then if we just have one slit, then we just get the single slit diffraction envelope. And if we have light passing through both slits, then we have that diffraction envelope being modulated by the two beam interference fringes. And if we illuminate that with white light, and the path difference is really absolutely zero, we still will get constructive interference and a bright fringe in the middle. But as we get further away from the center, we have the different colors in the spectrum having their maxima and minima at different positions uh, because the wavelengths difference and the fringe pattern takes on this multicolored system. And it's really quite hard to set up an interferometer to get the path length sufficiently similar to actually generate white light interference fringes. In that case, the incoherence of that white light means that the interference, the coherence length of the light is only a few microns. And so the path difference can only be one or two or three microns for you to see interference fringes. And once the path difference gets larger than that, the interference fringes disappear. And this is actually something that is very advantageous when you start to think about how you might do um, 3D microscopy using light, in, such as in the optical surface profiler. So this is just the first schematic of what the layout of an optical surface profiler is. Uh, and the instrument that I'll be describing and the measurements we do, it gets used in two ways. One's called vertical scanning interferometry. And this one uses incoherent light, white light, and face stepping interferometry. And this one uses a relatively coherent light, um, which is a very narrow filtered uh, from a bright uh, source in our particular instrument. So you have the um, interference is going to be caused between light that's reflected and scattered off the sample with light that is reflected off a reference mirror. So that's very flat and the sample will have topology. Okay, okay so what's the principle here? Well, the, the two beam interferometer that is best uh, one to explain what happens with the difference in the coherence of the light that you're using uh, is the Michelson. So Michelson interferometer, we have our light coming here being split by the beam splitter, one beam going to a fixed mirror, one beam going to a movable mirror. They recombine and interfere and you see the interference outcome on this detector here, which is a CCD camera in this case. So if this is a single frequency laser beam, as you move this mirror, when you have constructive interference, then you'll just have a bright red spot. And as you move the mirror to the position where you get destructive interference, you'll see this dim to become dark, and then it will become bright again as the path difference changes such that you're getting back to an integer multiple of wavelengths path difference. If you have a much larger difference in the path lengths, then you don't just see a single fringe, you'll see multiple fringes. And if you tilt the mirror, then you'll get straight line fringes. So that's your standard sort of Michelson. If you illuminate it with white light, then you will only get white light fringes when the path length difference is a zero to a couple of microns. And so you can see here the pattern when you have zero path difference and 
that being washed out as you increase the path length difference. And if you use that from a, in a 3D uh, profiling situation, then what you have is the, at any time when you've got this profile, only some of the heights of this sample will be able to generate uh, white light fringes. So if you think about what's happening as you're moving either the specimen or one of the, 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 well, the, the movable mirror is now given as the specimen here, then you'll have high contrast fringes for the bits that are close to zero path difference. And as you scan the specimen, the positions where you have the high contrast fringes will differ. And so when you're using the profiler, which in our case, um, if you, as you scan the sample, you can look and see these high visibility fringes coming from different part of your sample. So that's using low coherence in the vertical scanning interferometry mode to do 3D profiling of things that in our case can be up to a couple of millimeters difference in height. So that's the vertical scanning interferometry. For the phase stepping interferometry, this only works for surfaces that are flat to within, say, a, a, a order, a, a quarter of a wavelength. So in our case, that might be you know, 160 nanometers or so. And in this case, you have um, three different definite phase steps. So you, you set this phase at one value, you record an interferogram, you set it at another value, it records another interferogram, you set it to a third value, and then you have some very sophisticated modeling and software that actually uh, extracts uh, the profile of your sample, which is a, in that case, a very flat sample, uh, and you can measure it to within a, a quarter, of things within a quarter of the wavelength of the light you're using. So that's uh, our general idea. We can see that if we have a sample and we're doing phase stepping interferometry, for a, a given interferogram here, we've got a height step and we can see the shift uh, in the um, position of the fringes in that case. Uh, and eventually we can build a profile. In this case, is a reference step that's used for calibrating the instrument uh, with that technique. Okay. And a little bit of history, um, a lot of the development for optical uh, interferometry for surface profilers was done by James C. Wyant and people who worked with him uh, at the uh, Optical Sciences Center in Arizona. Uh, and what they used to have um, in, in, in the 1981 meeting here, where people who were developing new instruments could actually have take the whole instrument to the conference, set it up on a bench and actually demonstrate it to people. And this is what had happened uh, with this in its history. This was just some of those very early results of actually using uh, the technique uh, to be able to uh, measure heights on uh, magnetic tape uh, was one of the interesting problems that they wanted to have a solution for at the time. So there's a whole range of um, commercial instruments. And as I said, mostly they get used for measuring surface roughness and contouring that's relatively straightforward. We're trying to stretch the instruments a bit with some of the things that we're doing. Okay. This just gives you a bit of the timeline uh, of the development of these instruments. The instrument that we have is this uh, circa here. Uh, and though you might think that's um, rather an old instrument now, it is actually a bit of a peak in instrumentation because um, since then, uh, the, much of the effort has gone into uh, making um, instruments that don't have quite as much capacity in their pushing their specs is the instrument that we have, but which are a bit cheaper, easier to use, and which fit with a lot of the volume uses that the instruments get used for. Um, so, and this is just, again, if you uh, are a person who uh, devotes uh, their large part of their life to actually developing the both the, the physics, the um, computer modeling and the software development and everything that goes into making an instrument like this, uh, then you can actually become a rather rich person as well. And uh, James C. Wyant, uh, when he retired uh, from the Optical Sciences Center, donated uh, 
$20 million uh, from the, some of the money that he, he, he'd made uh, through selling uh, the uh, technology for optical surface profilers uh, back to the uh, institute that he'd worked for uh, for a very long time, uh, which is actually a very generous and, uh, thing to do. Okay. So we've had two profilers at various stages of our work. Um, this is the NT9800, the one I'm going to be talking mostly about um, today. Uh, and these are pretty easy instruments to use. Okay, And that's just the laser system that we were now using to do some of our um, profiling, uh, to, sorry, sorry, our laser processing. It's an eczema laser. Uh, and now we're using that system and a different experiment than the one I uh, introduced at the beginning. And this is where you know time passes. Uh, in the time it took us to get set up to do our optical surface profiling, uh, there was no longer a copper vapor laser facility at Macquarie, but it established this eczema laser facility. And this is the one that we were using uh, for our uh, glass material lasers interactions materials. And the experiment that we were starting to look at now, which again is fitting in with what was of interest in the field at the time, was looking at the particles in this case, not being the irregularly shaped alumina particles I spoke about at the beginning, but being uh, spherical glass particles. And what these spherical glass particles do is they act like little spherical lenses for the laser beam. So we're now looking at an interaction where We've got a spherical particle on a glass surface, and we're looking at where we can lift those spherical particles off. And as and when we've exceeded the fluence for damaging the underlying surface, what is the nature of that damage? And it's quite interesting, I think. And when you do um, rescattering type modeling, and also you can further enhance that model by taking the substrate into account. And you can see that when the sphere is about five microns in diameter, you get quite a strong and small near field focus uh, under the sphere. And when you have a very small particle, then the uh, near field focusing effect is not as uh, efficient. So this means that you can really think about starting to drill little holes in a surface using this near field focusing. And that's what people were doing uh, on silicon surfaces at the time. Uh, you can you could use this for patterning uh, silicon. Uh, but we were looking at this in the context of what was happening in glass. And the sorts of glasses that we're using here are um, standard type glasses. So not um, so if you think about a microscope slide, which is a borosilicate glass, uh, in optics terms, that's a very poor quality glass, generally speaking. Uh, a lot of our main optics we'd make with fusilica, uh, which is a much better quality glass in terms of having fewer impurities uh, within it and also um, having an extended transmission spectrum with respect to the light that passes through it. So we start out here. These would be the optical microscopy showing the little microspheres on the surface. And these are being done at higher fluences where damage is, is caused. And so just like the um, laser cleaning I showed you at the beginning of this section, if you have the fluence um, at an appropriate level, you can remove these spheres from the surface without doing any damage at all. Okay, so you can still do successful cleaning, but if you make the pulse fluence um, higher, you start to see these damage uh, sites appearing. And again, optical microscopy doesn't tell you anything about the form of them. It just tells you that there is damage there. Okay, and this is when the optical surface profiler comes in to tell you what the actual optical damage looks like. Slightly better um, showing, uh, again, the glass spheres. A couple of them haven't been removed in this case. And these are the damage sites where there was a sphere. And now you've got a damage site that you want to investigate. And when you use the optical surface profiler, then you can actually see that the what occurs in this damage actually evolves with fluence. So with one joule per centimeter cube, per centimeter squared uh, fluence in the single laser pulse that's been used in this case, what's actually happened is a little bit of this 
glass sphere has melted and broken off and is now adhered to the surface. And so that's the nature of the damage. When you increase that pulse fluence, you go to a point where that, that there's a sort of a pit uh, in the middle and these you end up with just these little bits adhered at the side. And eventually at higher fluence, you're migrating to these um, contoured rings, which actually reflect uh, the molten glass having formed and moved according to the optoelastic uh, behaviours that's been driven by a whole bunch of quite complex physics that's going on in the system. So that was with the borosilicate glass and just a couple more of those just to get the sense of uh, what they actually look like. And this just is showing the optical surface profile of um, the glass itself and notice the height scale here is 20 nanometers. So we've got a couple of little pits here, but mostly these, uh, this structure that you're seeing in the surface profile of the actual polished glass is actually only a few nanometers. So this is, you know, if, if, if even this very, very highly polished, very flat um, fusilica surface can be seen to look quite rough if you actually look at it um, closely enough. Uh, with your optical surface profiler. So what happens now if you instead have this uh, few silica, uh, in this case, the light is going to be um, transmitted through the few silica. And what we actually see is quite a different type of damage. You've got where there was a uh, sphere near that sphere, you see uh, a, what I call a, a bivalve shaped uh, a chunk of glass. This, and it turns out that it's the apex of that is where the focus of the uh, laser beam would be underneath that. And that actually is where a crack is generated and you create two new surfaces and you get these sort of characteristic um, geometries for the damage sites. So a quite different type of damage for the um, glass slides, which are a more absorbing, but not particularly absorbing, but more absorbing at the UV wavelength uh, than these this brittle uh, glass response for fused silica. And again, just to come back to this point that when you have the laser pulse fluence low enough, you can just clean these off um, and not damage the surface at all. So we, we were doing this work in for two purposes. One was to actually do successful cleaning. Uh, and it's it's always sort of confuses audiences when they see that you actually do some damage along the way, but characterizing the damage is very important, but also showing a successful cleaning is important as well. Okay. And so we did a little bit of playing around with um, shining the beam from the front or the back. And you can see that it's only when you shine the laser beam through the front and get this near field focusing effect that you get these bivalve um, damage sites. If you go the other way, you can lift the particles off at high affluence without uh, doing the, any damage. But I'm going to skip that a bit more quickly now and skip a couple of slides. Okay. So that is just to give you the um, that this is a technique that's very nice for actually characterizing these otherwise very difficult to characterize topologies. Uh, from that work, we had a, a, a colleague that was having a problem with the VUV gratings where they were doing some very um, important spectroscopy work. And the grating that they were using in their VUV spectrometer uh, had a particular step height for the grating. And when you have a theory, these step heights for the UV gratings are actually quite small, so a few tens of nanometers. Uh, and the theory of them says that depending what that step height is, they will have nulls in the um, wavelength range through which the spectrometer will not transmit any light. And this becomes where these nulls are is an important part of also, you know, second check of actually calibrating your spectrum, which is actually really hard to do uh, in the VUV. And so our colleague asked us if we would be able to measure the height of the steps in this holographic um, grating uh, to see how uh, homogeneous they were. And it turned out that, and again, we're making these measurements over 
much larger areas than would be readily available using the optical surface profiler. And it turns out that they were particularly homogeneous. So this was showing uh, that you had a step height that was uh, had a peak at 56.2. That was the most prevalent uh, step height. But the spread of those step heights was up to almost 13 nanometers. And with that knowledge, uh, our colleague was then able to go back and look at the theory of what the relative grating efficiency would be. And when you have that variation in the step height, you no longer get these nulls. So if you had a constant step height, you'd have a null and no light getting through the spectrometer at these wavelengths of just above 80 nanometers and uh, just above 40 nanometers. But when you have that variation, you've no null there. And that was a, a very important to our colleague who then knew that he was seeing spectral features at wavelength ranges where he otherwise thought there shouldn't be anything and it was a problem solved. So these are the things that you can do for other people along the way. Okay. And having done some work with gratings, we then had our colleagues from Madrid um, ask us to start looking at some of their laser induced periodic surface structures, which is one another way that people use for actually making gratings in polymer materials. Uh, and we characterized some of their gratings. And this was pushing our instrument uh, because this required us to try and resolve um, steps, periods in the grating, uh, which were uh, 266 nanometers. And it turned out that was a step too far uh, because I haven't mentioned so far, but because it's an optical microscope, with the um, Z scanning of our sample, we have really, really excellent uh, sub nanometer resolution of heights, but the lateral resolution is determined uh, by the optics of the surface profiler. And so about 300 nanometers is our resolution with the wavelengths that we're using. But we can still do some useful work for them. If, we've, if they've made uh, 532 nanometer space gratings, we can uh, measure those very nicely and through using Fourier transforms, uh, get the um, periodic information very readily for them. But even with the 266 nanometers, which we couldn't resolve the actual individual grooves in the grating, we could actually get a very good information for them about how the laser processing was actually roughening their surface overall, depending how they'd made um, those gratings. Okay. And now go on to all of these things start to build. Through this work we've done on the gratings, we've now started to really think about the linkage between measuring phase using phase stepping interferometry and how we can actually link that back to being able to measure um, the width of, in our case, um, nanowires uh, through knowing their geometry quite well, but not needing to actually be able to laterally resolve them. So if we have a look at a 100 nanometer nanowire using the surface profiler, once the nanowire gets to be below the lateral resolution, which is around about 300 nanometers, then laterally it still looks the same size. It looks 100 nanometer nanowire gives you a 300 nanometer type spot in your profile. But the uh, light that's in that has changed and we can use phase measurement if we know the geometry to actually get the size of the nanowires. And so that's where we're heading next. Okay. And this theory behind this, which I'm not going to go through, but you need to be able to link knowing the geometry. So you, you, you and being able to model, model the light being propagated through the optics of the surface profiler. And so you can predict what the detected field will look like for a particular nanowire of a particular radius. And that's what's done here. There's some other um, refinements that have to come into account. If you've got a nanowire sitting on a surface, then you actually have to take into account that you actually get some shadowing, uh, that you've got the light incident on this and it doesn't get uh, everywhere. So you have to take the shadowing into account. And so you can then come up with your theoretical model of 
what the actual phase, because you're measuring now, if you've got a nanowire, you can measure the phase in the instrument that runs the length of that cylindrical nanowire, and you can turn that into a height just by the standard relationship between phase uh, and uh, wavelength, so phase, phase, phase and phase number. So we've got here um, the, the measurements that we were able to make on uh, nanowires of different known radii. And we can see, uh, and of course, we had no uh, knowledge of, you know, they were a nominal radius that was given to us by the people who had fabricated them. Uh, they may in fact have varied uh, a bit within that themselves, but we see that we actually can get a very good agreement between measurements uh, and what was expected for these. And what was more convincing was we had one nanowire which had a very nice taper on it, which went for a few microns, and that was able to be measured by SEM. And then we could compare uh, what was expected uh, for the um, theory with what we observed from the experimental uh, measurements for that tapered waveguide. And you can see the actual change uh, in the measured phase uh, going from being positive to negative as you go uh, through the appropriate um, position there. So these were very nice um, measurements, which we were able to present at a post-deadline uh, paper at one of the CLIOs uh, from that. Okay, so I'm, I'm probably going to speed up a little bit now because I think I've probably been speaking for long enough, but I'll just give you a bit of a flavour of uh, what we've done with a couple of the spider silks. Um, these colour displays that you can get on um, orb webs uh, in natural light are, are really beautiful, and we've published um, about the interpretation of those. But what, what we learned... Um, about these sorts of what I would call high quality um, orb webs of spiders is every element of these webs can be regarded as a high quality optic. Okay, when you look at these uh, silks up close, then the radials are um, double cylinders of a, basically an N and a refractive index about 1.55 material. The capture spiral is a different but similar double cylinder of a different silk that comes from a different gland in the spider that has little aqueous droplets on it. And those little droplets are like little elliptical lenses. And that's, you can look at those under the microscope. And this is some of our um, bright field uh, images for, for the different um, types of spiders that we work on in Australia. This is showing um, a radial, and these are the sort of junctions where they have the um, adhesive material and cement that comes from another gland. So there's all sorts of different optical materials going into these webs. Uh, and I say refractive index 1.55. Well, that's because we've measured it, and that wasn't an easy uh, thing to do, and I'm not going to be talking about that today. But one of the other things we have done is looking at some of these droplets with our surface profile and some silks as well. So these are the spiders that we've worked with. These are all Australian spiders. Other parts of the world have their analogues of these spiders. Uh, they come in different sizes. They have uh, different widths of their silks. But these silks are in the range for adult spiders of being cylinders with diameters that are about one to 10 microns, depending on the size of the spider. So these are very, very, very fine silks and very fine optical fibers in a sense. And the actual material that spider silks made of is quite a complex uh, nanocomposite. So at the um, protein level, you have um, beta sheet, sheet crystalline protein embedded in an amorphous uh, alpha helix uh, type matrix. Uh, and there's a, a really lot of material physics in this, which I'm not going to go into today. We've published quite a lot in this particular area, but I'm just talking about the profiling today. And this is one of the things that we did was looking at the actual profile of these uh, adhesive droplets. Uh, and there was a bit of controversy in the literature about the shape of these droplets. And we were able to, using um, 
our optical surface profile has shown that they are elliptical and that mattered to certain people, but I'm just going to rush through that now. The actual morphologies, this is some TEM of one of these double cylinders that I was uh, telling you about. Uh, and the actual different spiders that we work with, they actually have some variation in these cross sections and that leads to quite a lot of interest as well, but I won't have time to talk about that. But just if you think about what, how it matters if you have this double cylinder of silk, which is the way the spider lays each of its threads down as a double cylinder, then that changes the uh, scattering that you get from the silk. And we can actually model the, the, the scatterer, the theory of the scatterer, and also model that the light from that being propagated through the surface profiler and actually start to make some very nice connections between sizes of things uh, and silks that way as well. But I'm just going to show a little bit here about what happens, what you can actually see with the profiler, where you can, these silks, which are only, you know, one, two, three microns in diameter, you can get these really very nice uh, profiles of the silks themselves. Uh, and you can start to see uh, when you have, if you've had the thread oriented in different ways, and if they're off to the side, you can start to see the line of that double cylinder of these very fine silks. And you can use um, some uh, protonase K treatment to actually di to digest a little bit of the silk and make the uh, separation of those uh, much, much more apparent. So you can actually start to see them uh, splitting apart as you've done a little bit of digestion of some of the material. Uh, you can look at profiles of the silks from the different spiders, and I won't go into these, but we've looked at um, contrasting four spiders, the silks from four different spiders now, and there's actually some significant uh, differences between them, which uh, lead to some interesting studies. Okay, the very last thing that I'm going to talk about just quickly is what we've been doing um, more recently, uh, and this is using a femtosecond laser processing system uh, and to look at uh, processing of muscovite. This, it turns out this is a very interesting material. We started doing this because we wanted to do fiducial marking of muscovite for using this as um, for substrates for various other sorts of nanoscopic um, measurements. But it's turned out it's, it's actually been a really interesting fundamental study in its own right. Uh, and that's really more what we've been doing in the meantime. And so this is showing you that when you are using a, again, it's a single femtosecond laser pulse we use of different fluences. So we're increasing uh, the laser power as we go through the sequence of um, profiles. And you get these systematic variations that go from little craters to a, a de-adhered bump over an area much, much larger than the actual laser beam itself to jets molten material bubbling and the profiler has become a very key instrument to actually really be able to measure the volumes and sizes and heights of these different elements of these very complex uh, laser processed sites uh, and we, we've been doing microvolumetric analyses recently which we've just published on so this again, I've, I've concentrated a bit in this talk on just showing the capability and a little bit of the story of the different sorts of things you can look at with an instrument like this. But all of these measurements then actually support um, scientific investigation of the underlying theories of the uh, interactions with the materials. And muscovite is emerging as a material that's incredibly interesting in this space. Okay, so I'll just finish now by acknowledging uh, that uh, the research has been supported by the Australian Research Council uh, through linkage and discovery projects. Uh, and some of the studies have been carried out using facilities uh, at the um, Optifab node of the Australian, Nan Australian National Fabrication Facility. Uh, and I'd like to uh, thank all of our co-workers for the shared science and Ben Johnson at our department for uh, working on the muscovite work more recently. Uh, and so just finally, thank you for listening and I hope that you will have some questions that I can answer. Um, this is a tweet I sent out today uh, to the uh, optics community 
um, giving people a little bit of a uh, challenge to determine uh, what this is. It's not, I, I took this out of the tweet, sorry, it's not a very good quality picture. The one I took on my phone's a better one today, but um, this is saying you know, that in this case, trying to look at this and try and work out what this is an image of, and I won't give you any more hints, uh, but the thing I tweeted was uh, some may be interested to work out, guess what is pictured here, and knowledge of some of our optics research may be an advantage, but may not be. Um, and the thought for the day, sometimes it's better not to focus, sometimes you can't. Uh, but anyway, I won't explain that, but, that's it. but if anybody uh, is interested to check that out and think about it, um, please do. But at that point, um, I will um, end the uh, show uh, and hopefully go back to the other screen uh, and hopefully answer some questions that people might have. And thank you very much. Thank you, Madam, for your wonderful presentation. So we have got a few questions uh, in the inbox. So if you allow, I can start the discussion session. So uh, first, uh, what is the laser cavity alignment? I think uh, you have already uh, explained in your lecture, but we have got a question. Oh. Okay. So this is, I mean, in, in order to have a laser operate, and um, of course, some lasers operate very easily. One of the early lasers that people operated was the nitrogen laser. Uh, and basically, you can put some pieces of glass on the end of a, a nitrogen discharge and it's got such a high gain that you can sort of just tilt those and get the beat of the light. So what the, the, the lasers are determining what the axis along which the light will be amplified. So if you if you have a gas laser then and you're um, getting a population inversion on a particular atomic transition in that gas and then even as, you, as you're amplifying that up, you would still be getting amplified spontaneous emission unless you actually start to build the photon field up to a higher degree. And it's putting the laser in place that actually reflects those photons that you've generated by spontaneous emission, amplified spontaneous emission, directs them back along the axis of the gas discharge. Mm -hmm. And that's the axis of now along which the amplification starts to occur. So then you put the mirrors in, and most mirrors now, they're not flat, they're curved, so you get a little bit of focus uh, of the light inside the cavity, and that's a more stable cavity. But that then just defines the axis along which you're going to build up that photon density and get um, the stimulated emission occurring and get lasing occurring. Thank you, Madam. So uh, we have got another question. So how can we measure uh, mass a muscovite is a natural mineral, okay, and that's that's one of the things that makes it um, very interesting. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the the muscovite that I showed you the sample of there, that's a standard um, sheet of muscovite that you can buy from any number of commercial suppliers uh, that mostly gets used as a substrate for AFM, but also for a substrate for other sorts of microscopy. It's a, the, the, one of the advantages of muscovite is it cleaves. So um, it's it's in terms of its crystal structure, it's a uh, an aluminous silica, but it's a nanolayered system which has potassium as the main cation and the sheets in the crystal where you have the potassium planes are less well bound. So the actual muscovite can be cleaved and you can uh, move, remove layers of the order of about a nanometer. But when you cleave it, that gives you a pristine, clean surface, and it's a very ultra flat surface. And it's it's a natural mineral, and obviously it occurs in different qualities. So the B1 quality is the highest quality, and you know that's a limited resource. So it's where people can mine it and and obtain it and cleave it into those nice um, sheets uh, and there's, there's a bit of natural variation and that natural variation leads to different outcomes when you do um, laser processing. It's actually, it's a really fascinating material um, uh, in that regard. So, but you know, people do make synthetic muscovite, but as best I've been able to tell, it's only um, for the sort of, um, you know, not for, 
for an optical use. You wouldn't, nobody synthesized anything approaching an optical quality. And, you know, these minerals get made at high pressure and temperature somewhere in the earth, right? And so it's, you know, the conditions there are very difficult to um, reproduce uh, to create that type of material uh, as a man-made material in any volume. I mean, I've got colleagues at ANU who create, um, you know, brand new materials using focused laser beams and iron beams and things, and they, they are creating tiny volumes of these materials inside another material by creating very, very high pressures and temperatures using lots of laser power. But, you know, nobody can do that at volume at the moment. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, this may be the last question. So, what is the silk morphology? Sorry, why is the silk? Morphology. The morphology of, um, okay, so I'm not sure which part of the, the the silk i mean maybe in terms of the again i i'm not sure that this there's, there's papers that are published about the tem of silk and we've done a bit of um t cross sections of tem of spider silk ourselves um the actual preparation that you use to create the sample so embedding it in resin and rendering it into a form um, that won't just, you know, kind of ev evaporate when you put an electron beam on it. Um, you know, that does actually change the morphology a bit, we, we, we believe. Um, but the morphology, the cross-sectional morphology of most silks is taken to be a core material and often the inner core of that is um, deemed to be more crystalline than the outer edge of that cylindrical core. And then outside of that, there's um, a, a skin layer and then a, a lipid layer. So, um, and particularly with one of the spider silks we've studied quite a lot, which is the, um, what used to be the, the uh, which is now called the plebsy burner spider, um, that actually has a much thick, thicker skin um, than other spider silks we've worked with the uh, Ajaya P uh, and the Nephila. And so, so the, and there's 46,000 species of spiders in the world. And of course, not, they're not all orb weavers. So probably of those, um, maybe, you know, several thousand of them are, are high quality orb weavers. But that's a lot of potential um different materials and just from the four that we've studied um there, there are there are really quite significant differences in the optical properties we've we've just published recently um some work on the photo reflectance of different silks uh and they 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 all have quite different photo reflectance uh, spectra uh, and the form of them affects that as well as the actual material but there's definitely a material component to that so and in terms of on the nanoscopic scale then you've you've got you know the the nanofibrils um forming into the um sort of melding into the the core the cylinders in the first place but again and from my reading um, there's there's still quite a lot of uncertainty about really what the the morphology of spider um, some spider silks is, um, and and of course the actual proteins because you know the most silk in the world um, comes from the silkworm the Bombyx mori silk, um, and the the uh, the proteins from Bombyx mori silk are different than those from spiders the one from spiders get called spidroans um so so that and it is a it is an area of um a, a, a lot of study in the world uh, because of course silk is a very useful spider in all manner of means yeah thank you madam so uh, some of our students uh, so asked me as to so request me to ask you that if any of our students want to join your lab uh, so, or your university what in this field what she or he need to do for that okay um well of course you know times in australian universities are a little bit financially stricken at the moment 
Um, but in terms of what the un most universities in Australia, and mine included, um, do offer um, scholarships to international students to do PhDs. Um, they're, they're quite highly competitive, um, but it's an open application round uh, at a particular time of the year. Uh, and uh, there the may well be a round um, opening relatively soon. Um, the university for entry into PhDs uh, requires a master's that has uh, a, a full year of research in it. Um, and so sometimes if people have done a master's that doesn't meet that requirement, then they might have to come and do a second year of our MRES. And there have been in the past scholarships that do a bundle of a second year of an MRES and a PhD. Um, but I mean, if people have um, specific uh, inquiries, then anybody looking to join the university has to identify a supervisor and uh, build up a project, a short project proposal as part of the application process. So, um, so the best thing is to email um, anybody and you can look on um, the web pages at this, my university or any Australian university and see what people are doing and identify people uh, that you might like to get in touch with to make and uh, see what the opportunity uh, might be and uh, what the projects might be. Um, but as I say at the moment, it's uh, pretty highly, very competitive because money's a little bit short. Yeah, thank you, Madam. So we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pavna University of Science and Technology for accepting our invitation, Madam. So the main aim of our program is to motivate our students in this corona pandemic situation. And uh, we are trying to do our best. So we have completed uh, uh, today uh, uh, our, our uh, 157 international physics webinar. So we are trying. And uh, uh, if some of, of our students or some of those who are watching this, uh, if motivated, and then uh, after uh, after completing their masters and uh, bachelor, if they join in this, so then it will be. Uh, uh, great thing for me and for us so thanks again for helping us in doing this uh, great show, webinar well if anybody has any further questions or feedback um please email okay my email was there deb.kane yeah. at, at mq.edu.au i'd i'd appreciate some feedback um it's it's a you know it's a little unusual for me to give a talk where i'm, I'm not interacting with the yeah. audience yeah. <laughs> So hopefully after the COVID, uh, uh, I will invite you uh, for a face-to-face -face session in Bangladesh, in our beautiful country. Uh, in that time, actually, uh, you can you can interact directly with the student. So thanks for uh, this uh, webinar, and uh, hopefully we'll arrange another webinar with you after a uh, uh, few months later, so when you are free. Thanks okay. for today. Okay. Thank you very much.